Good afternoon and welcome to this new edition of Forward Keys and Friends. I'm Olivier Ponti, VP for Insights at Forward Keys, and it is my pleasure uh, to uh, be with you today. Um, Forward Keys and Friends, it's our series of monthly webinars when we place the spotlight on one of our industry partners to discuss the future of travel um, with a strong focus on an effective use of data. Today, uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming a representative from Edinburgh Airport, Pavel Halas, uh, who is Aviation Development Manager. He knows the Edinburgh Airport inside out, and he's been working there for seven years, uh, and he will be able to tell us how the Edinburgh Airport has jumped from virtually zero passengers to 300,000 in a matter of weeks. Uh, unfortunately, we're experiencing some technical issues with Pavel's camera, so we will only be able to hear Pavel's voice. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Pavel, I would like to uh, welcome you very warmly to this uh, to this session. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Well, before uh, I leave the floor to Pavel, I would like uh, to remind our audience that uh, the presentation and the recording will be sent to you at the end of this session uh, and that you can ask questions throughout the webinar by using the uh, question button on the right hand side of your screen. Now, at the end of this presentation, we have time for uh, Q&A, but uh, without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Pavel. Pavel, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join this Forward Keys webinar with Edinburgh Airport. I am delighted uh, to have been given this opportunity to show um, you how Edinburgh Airport uh, recovery progressing from this uh, pandemic and also uh, to give you some insight on what data uh, we have used in order to give us the best possible chance to emerge from this crisis as a stronger airport with a better market share of the, of the UK aviation market. So let me start with the first slide, just to give you an overview of our journey so far in 2020. As you can see at the beginning of the year, uh, we kind of started where we left off from last year, so about a growth of 2%. Um, that has been a sort of consistent over the last two years. We were actually attacking nearly 15 million passengers over the last 12 months. But as we've entered February and uh, COVID has um, kind of come to the European shore and uh, you could have seen some cases in North Italy, the demand has slowly started to slow. And uh, things got definitely worse in March as uh, Flybe has entered or uh, Flybe entered uh, administration and ceased operations. Flybe was the fourth largest carrier in Edinburgh with about 1.3 million passengers per year, about 9% of our traffic. Actually, on the first day when Flybe ceased the operation, we've managed to recover six of the 12 Flybe routes. However, they never restarted as UK uh, entered lockdown a couple of weeks later. So basically, over a very short period of time, we went down from about 187 daily departures to three daily departures. These were to Amsterdam with KLM, uh, Heathrow with BA, and um, Ryanair to Dublin. So that was a perfect opportunity for us to reset, rethink, and um, look how we're gonna recover from this crisis and uh, what we need to do in order to give us the best chance. So that's why I want to show you a couple of slides that we created and we shared with the airlines and how we approach this crisis and uh, then give you an overview how we are getting on, where, where we are, because uh, now we are in uh, September and we've already recovered about 22% of the last year's market. So let me start you with some data. So first of all, we needed to establish how Edinburgh overcomes major worldwide crisis. So we used the example of the latest uh, global crisis, which was the 2007-2008 global financial crisis. We looked at uh, traffic from all the UK airports to all destinations for about a seven year period from 2006 until 2012. As you can see here on the first, uh, on the top uh, graph, Edinburgh's traffic actually remained very resilient during uh, this financial crisis. It uh, barely dropped, it's actually increased, especially in the international traffic, as you can see on the bottom graph. 
if you take an average UK regional airport, uh, that their uh, traffic would decline by 12%. Even London would decline by 7%. But Edinburgh was a really resilient, uh, very resilient market. Um, so we knew that Edinburgh deals with crisis uh, very well. Next, we had to establish what markets will be the fastest to recover and what markets will be the most resilient to recover. So again, using example of the global financial crisis, we looked at uh, traffic to all destinations from Edinburgh and we look at five key KPIs, resilience or passenger traffic, capacity, seat factor, fares. We looked at um, whether they went up, down, remain flat, and then we overlaid it with Forbrookie's lead time data to see what is the time difference between people booking flight and actually getting on the flight. This was very important to have access to this Forbrookie's data as it enables us to group markets uh, which are going to be the fastest to recover. So not really surprisingly, you can see uh, UK domestics, Ireland, Western Europe, which would make sense because uh, we were expecting that um, UK domestic travel would be the first one to kind of start. Ireland uh, has a common travel area, so that would be the next one. And perhaps Western Europe, the likes of France, Netherlands will be the one to follow afterwards. Then we look at what markets will be the most resilient or uh, were the most resilient during the global financial crisis. And again, not too surprising, you can see the Canary Islands. So as soon as the borders opened from the UK, people want to go or wanted to go to Canary Islands. But we also see Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, it's a very strong VFR market. So we knew that when borders reopen, people will want to go to see their families in Poland, Czech, Hungary, and so on. And actually, if you look at what's happening uh, today or over the last uh, couple of months, we were basically bang on. So it was a, a very good uh, start and we knew that uh, Edinburgh will recover and is a good market to uh, recover. The next one, we need to look at Edinburgh resilience just before the coronavirus crisis. So we look at different economic indicators. Uh, for example, unemployment, which you can see on the left graph, and high-skill occupations, which you can see on the right graph. Uh, as you can see, Edinburgh had a very low rate of unemployment uh, before the coronavirus crisis. So it was in a good position to, to weather this crisis. And also, loads of people worked in high-skill occupations. So uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, Edinburgh City, it, uh, it is a major global financial hub. Uh, it's a very strong digital, pharmaceutical, as well as insurance sector. So these kind of jobs you can probably do from home as well, uh, which is very important because if you look to the next slide, on the right hand side map, you can see the estimate share of workers who can work from home. The darker the circle, the higher the percentage of these uh, jobs that are able to work from home. And that was really important for us because the thought process behind this was that if you can work from home, you are likely to preserve your job. Uh, you will be stuck home for a couple of months. You will not spend any money. You will have the money to spend. And as soon as the borders reopen, you will want to go on a vacation. On another hand, if you look at the left-hand map, you can see a percentage of uh, self-employed people that are in the self-employment only. You want to be, or you know, if the color is the the lighter the color, the the lower the share. So you want to be kind of in the very light color. Um, and Edinburgh wasn't that exposed to to self-employment because perhaps that's gonna be more difficult to keep your job if you are self-employed rather than if you have ability to work from home. So Edinburgh was very well prepared to uh, face this crisis. So then finally, what we had to do is how will the future look like? What destinations will come up and uh, how is the demand uh, change, changing on a week and week basis? So luckily we had access to the forward keys data where we were able to track demand on a weekly basis. So this is an example of a slide that we shared with uh, our US careers. And a sort of a similar slide we would share with uh, all of our airlines. We could tailor made it. So if you were talking about uh, KLM, we would use Netherlands instead of the USA. But just to give you a snapshot, this is what was happening between US and Edinburgh. 
So on the left graph, you can see the flight searches between Edinburgh and USA. And on the right graph, you can see the conversion rate. So how many people click book on the on the Skyscanner uh, you know, platform that former keys then takes and uh, uses this uh, data to uh, give us the, the kind of uh, front end uh, product, if you like. So when we did this in May, we were estimating that uh, US would sort of pick up by September time. Uh, loads of people who are traveling to Orlando, uh, Florida during July time were postponing their holidays for October time. And then New York was coming really strongly over the Christmas time period. Um, and you could also so see that as the weeks were kind of progressing, the number of searches was slowly increasing. So we were seeing the optimism that demand is picking up. Obviously, this, this was on the back of USA overcoming the first wave, but very soon after they hit the second wave. So this has completely changed. But when we were looking in May, September was in the unrealistic market. Uh, unrealistic time for the US market to pick up. Then uh, we needed to restore consumer confidence when all this traffic returns back to the airport. So we were, we completely changed the terminal. Uh, we, as we installed one way system uh, for departures and arrivals, as you can see here. Um, everywhere in the terminal, we installed hand sanitation stations. So before you enter the terminal, before you enter security, after security, throughout the terminal. Uh, we installed protective screens, uh, face masks were mandatory throughout the terminal. We were measuring people's temperature and we ran a big fly safe campaign uh, through local media and also through our own online channels just to make sure that uh, we are a COVID safe airport and when the demand returns, uh, passengers will have the confidence to travel through our airport safely. So this is kind of a very brief summary to what, to what we did and uh, how we did it. Uh, and now let's look how we are getting on. So here we can see a graph with daily passengers from June until August and also daily flights. So as I was telling you before, we kind of went from 180 flights a day to about three flights a day. Um, that was for April, May was a little bit higher, perhaps five flights a day. So now we were in June. Uh, contrary to basically every European nation, UK didn't close the borders or didn't quarantine arrivals during the height of the pandemic. So during April and May. But as European countries uh, had started to open their borders in June, UK decided to quarantine all the arrivals into the UK. So actually, our June traffic was pretty much the same as May. It was a little bit higher because from uh, mid uh, June, EasyJet restarted some domestic flights and Ryan, uh, uh, you know, restarted some Spanish flights. But it was really in July when uh, EasyJet and Ryanair uh, sort of uh, ramped up the operation to about 40, 50 percent of the of the last year capacity, and you can immediately see an increase in passengers. Uh, however, we still had the quarantine in place. So while we were seeing quite strong uh, outbound flows, uh, the inbound flows were really restricted by, by this. However, by sort of mid-July, um, the UK government alongside Scottish government announced air bridges. So suddenly you can see, or you know, you were able to travel to many European places quarantine free, and you can see the spike in uh, traffic. Um, however, soon after, Spain was uh, added back on the quarantine list. And uh, despite the fact that we, we had um, airlines like Lufthansa and uh, Finnair, Aegean uh, restarting the operations in um, August, which would mean that our growth would kind of continue all the way up, um, we saw a spike in cases around uh, Europe, which meant uh, many European countries were put on the quarantine list. And um, basically, our passengers have sort of plateaued at about 10,000 uh, daily. So that's where we are currently. Um, obviously, quarantine and government restrictions uh, play a key, key role in our uh, recovery. So if you look at this map, and this is basically the current travel status. So uh, you need to focus on the green, because the green countries are countries where you can travel and come back quarantine free. So currently there is only seven 
countries in Europe where we can travel directly from Scotland and return back quarantine free. Those ones in red, that's where UK is imposing the quarantine upon the arrivals. And those ones in uh, yellow or you know orange is where you where the foreign countries are imposing uh, quarantine. So this map a month ago was almost all green, whereas now there is not that many green uh, places left. Uh, we can track quarantine um, or the dim demand based on the quarantine. We can track it in real real time. So you know, again, here is a is a snapshot of our keys data that we sent to the airlines on a weekly basis. So for example, here is a case of Portugal and Netherlands. So as you can see, Netherlands here on the on the right one, um, it was progressing pretty well. The recovery versus last year was getting better and better every week until early July, or oh, sorry, early August, when um, UK government added Netherlands on the quarantine list. And you can immediately see that the demand for travel between Netherlands and the UK dropped immediately. The load factors went from 50 to 60 percent down to 20 virtually overnight. A similar story, but on a more positive note, was with Portugal. Uh, Portugal was omitted from the quarantine free travel basically the whole summer until um, very end of August when uh, both UK and Scottish governments decided to put uh, Portugal on the on the green list and you can see how the demand week on week changed instantly. I mean the the searches went from 2,000 per week to 100,000. It was it was a massive surge and again virtually overnight load factors went from 20 to 50 percent. So this is very important for us to have access to to this data as we can track the demand and the changes in demand on uh, almost daily basis. And uh, finally, I'd like to show you how is our recovery uh, progressing versus our key competitors in the UK's aviation market. So actually, between July and September 2020, we've managed to increase our seat share of Central Scotland market by seven percentage points. So we gain uh, seven uh, percentage points higher market share. So uh, Edinburgh is now around 70% of all the seats in the Central Scotland market. If you look at the right and the uh, graph, you can see that again, if you compare Edinburgh versus other UK airports, that Edinburgh was recovering in July and August faster than most of the UK airports. The September day, data, we have a very good understanding of what's happening from Edinburgh, but we don't have a full picture of what's happening from other, other UK airports due to the constantly changing um, allocation of capacity. But thanks to to uh, forward keys and thanks to the approach that we uh, took back in uh, March and April as soon as uh, borders were uh, managed to kind of uh, get off the hooks uh, much faster than uh, lots of, of our competitors so here I'd like to uh, just finish and say that having the right data and having access to the right data was absolutely instrumental in our recovery and that the whole um, you know data uh, the data allocation is completely changed whereas historically uh, you would look at historical data whereas everybody now wants to see how will the future look like so having the right data in place was absolutely important for us to give us the best possible chance for recovery. Um, and on this note, I'd like to thank you for joining this uh, webinar and for uh, listening to me. And now I'd like to pass back to Olivier. Thank you so much, Pavel. Uh, you, uh, we need to thank for sharing your, your expertise with us. This has been extremely interesting. Uh, while we let the audience a uh, few minutes or a few seconds to write uh, write some questions, I'd like to uh, remind you that um, Edinburgh Airport is using flight search uh, data or flight search solution, and that if you would like to get uh, more information regarding this uh, service, uh, you can always reach out to us at webinars at webinars sorry at forwardkeys.com. 
Now, uh, it's time uh, for uh, the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to kick off this session with, uh, with a remark and a question. The remark is that um, Edinburgh Airport has been the first uh, client for forward keys uh, for this flight search solution. Um, Pablo, uh, how it comes that, that uh, you and your team have been such early adopters of the, of the tool? Is there, what is there between, between Edinburgh Airport and data? Uh, yes, we are very lucky because our shareholders are a private equity firm and they are very data oriented people. So from the very early days when I joined the airport in 2013, everything was about data. So we, we were always looking at ways how we can improve our, uh, our uh, you know, data or the database that we have. And uh, we were looking for a, uh, for a flight search or a forward looking data for quite a long time. And um, when we came around your uh, product and uh, trialed it, it was uh, instantly something that we, that we wanted uh, because, you know, historically how you would um, look at different markets, you, you know, you would take a market, you would look at the indirect traffic and then you would apply a certain uh, stimulation rate but uh, for some niche markets, uh, let, uh, you know, let me give you an example of Rotterdam. Um, a very small niche market doesn't have um, perhaps legacy carriers flying in, so it's very difficult to get an understanding of the true market potential. But thanks to for keys, we were actually able to see how many people search um, to fly between Edinburgh and uh, Rotterdam. And then how many people perhaps um, exit uh, onto booking an Amsterdam flight. And then we could overlay it with our CA data to see what is the leakage between um, Edinburgh and Amsterdam that goes to Rotterdam. And thanks to this data, we were able to convince Transavia to, uh, to start and open a new route between Rotterdam and uh, Edinburgh. And that's something that, that in the old kind of fashion way wouldn't be possible. Okay, so basically data has helped you um, uh, enter a conversation with an airline like Transavia and, and you managed to convince them that there was an, an opportunity there. But now that, that we are in the middle of this COVID crisis, I believe the relationship that maybe the balance of power, uh, the kind of collaboration between airports and airlines is changing, right? Um, could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, I mean, the aviation industry has always been a very closed uh, industry. The people are very close together. They uh, they know each you know other, and there has always been a, a collaboration. But what we have found out during this uh, crisis is that when people were sitting at home and um, there was lots of uncertainty, that they were always very happy to to uh, have a chat and look at data. Uh, you, you know, how is the demand recovering? Uh, because the airlines have the benefit of perhaps seeing the demand recovering based on their forward bookings or based on how many people are entering their website. But for the airports, it is more, di more difficult. Or for some of the niche airlines, it could be more uh, difficult. So, um, you know, having this data in place, uh, again, was uh, really important to uh, have these conversations. And going into the future, I think there will be more uh, collaboration between the airports uh, themselves and also a closer collaboration with the, with the airlines and also other partners like the uh, DMOs and uh, marketing companies. Uh, because what this crisis has taught us that, uh, you know, by being together, uh, it's making uh, our job uh, easier. And that's why I was very happy to share this uh, data that we sh show to the airlines and how we recover from this crisis. So perhaps other airports can go and take inspiration of uh, how we do things that will uh, help them to recover when um, another crisis comes. You mentioned DMOs uh, and, and future models of collaborations. Do you have any any more specific ideas in uh, in mind as to how DMOs could help airports recover and develop new routes? Yes, I would love um, if DMOs would be able to uh, to underwrite seats on the uh, on the planes uh, so for example we hear or when we pitch for some niche routes 
or perhaps some uh, long haul routes, um, the airlines ask us, do you have any uh, tour operators, travel a agencies or uh, companies in Edinburgh that would be willing to buy a portion of the seats to reduce the risk for us? And um, while we hear from the, from the travel trade that, yes, we would like to have a route to this place or this place, when we mention a possibility of uh, underwriting a capacity, it's also quite, it's always kind of difficult. It's not something that perhaps uh, they would like to undertake the risk, but we know from Hello, other places. I believe we've lost you. Hello, can you hear me again? Yes, you're back, you're back. We, we've lost you for a few seconds. If you could uh, repeat your sentence, please. So yes, that it, uh, we know from, um, from other places around uh, Europe, if I take example of Denmark, is that um, they have a very close collaboration with the local DMOs and uh, they are willing to, to purchase a capacity allocation on some of the, their wish list routes. So if that's something that could uh, be implemented in, uh, in Scotland or we can have a closer collaboration and share the risk alongside the, the airlines, uh, that would be something very useful for us in our recovery progress. Okay, um, thank you, thank you so much, Favo. I'm uh, reminded by by our team here that uh, we can also receive questions uh, via email, webinar at forwardkeys.com. So if you have some questions to ask for this Q and A, please use either the question function uh, within this uh, this uh, go to webinar environment or emails. Now, um, getting uh, getting Back to the question. Uh, we have one uh, that comes from the from the audience, uh, which is quite long. So let me let me scan it, or let me read it aloud. Uh, Olivia and Pavel, thank you for arranging this informative session. Uh, great learning points. I have three questions, if I may. I would be interested to hear your view on the Edinburgh Airport routes that you anticipate will have the largest percentage of recovery in Q4. Also, do you believe that we can expect a surge in leisure booking demand in Q1 for uh, the first semester of uh, 2021, providing there is no further escalation of uh, COVID? And finally, what are the regional businesses saying about the level of executive travel demand moving forward? Many thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very good uh, questions. Question. Very good. Uh, all three are very good questions. Um, in terms of the the kind of thickest routes that we are seeing now from Edinburgh, so um, I think even now more than ever, domestic market it will be very important. Um, so even though we have uh, perhaps 50% lower capacity to London than we had last year, uh, these will be the the most important routes. Uh, but also, I need to mention the likes of KLM uh, that uh, we're looking to fly up to four times a day to uh, Amsterdam. Uh, they are currently at three times a day. Uh, and considering that's uh, sort of the same frequency as perhaps, or even higher frequency that uh, the likes of uh, British Airways have on London Heathrow, I think that was uh, pretty, pretty impressive. In terms of leisure demand returning back in Q1 2021, absolutely. We can see from our data that when um, UK decided to quarantine Spanish arrivals, people immediately transferred to Turkey or Greece. When it was uh, then Greece being in the quarantine, people moved to Turkey or Cyprus. So people want to go on their vacation. Um, it is, uh, or you know, British public loves their uh, vacation and it's important uh, that they can uh, travel safely uh, to uh, safe destinations. And um, yeah, I definitely think the demand will recover in terms of regional, what are they saying about uh, corporate travel? I think that um, corporate travel might be difficult to recover before end of the year. I would expect that uh, loads of big businesses kind of following the same trend as perhaps us in Edinburgh Airport that uh, until the end of the year, if you can work from home, work from home. Um, so perhaps Q1 2021 will be really the time if we don't need the second peak, of course, um, that the uh, corporate traffic will recover. But equally, we are we are hearing um, from many 
you know, businesses and the airlines that, look, we haven't had a face-to-face -face contact for almost half a year. So we want to go and meet people face-to-face -face and discuss some of these important things face-to-face. -face. So I am hopeful that um, the demand, the corporate demand will recover sooner, perhaps uh, with the introduction of winter 20 schedule. Uh, that will be my, uh, my wish, but I am a little bit cautious on that. All right. Thank you, Pavel, for this uh, for this answer. I think it's a it's a good moment to uh, to close this uh, this Q and A session. One thing I, I keep in mind as well, which I believe is a, is a source of uh, of hope, is that there is pent up demand, and as you as you've just mentioned, people really want to travel still, even in the, in COVID times. But uh, sometimes government policies uh, do not help, especially ever changing uh, uh, travel restrictions. So, um, provided um, governments manage to get this a little bit uh, more in order and provide more stability, uh, uh, people will be able to, to resume uh, their, uh, their travel habits and, and fly uh, some more. Uh, I hope um, this will happen uh, soon. I hope we'll uh, together see more people back in the in the air and flying uh, either from or to uh, Edinburgh Airport. Um, Pavel, thank you once more for your, your presence today. Uh, it's been very, very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to our audience, I'd like to uh, mention that uh, we're still working on the October edition of uh, Forward Keys and Friends, where we have a very special guest, and uh, I would like to ask you to stay tuned uh, to know more about the exact dates and identity of this special guest. Thank you very much for your presence today, and uh, see you next month. Goodbye. <laughs>